Okay, take your Bibles with me again to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to be reading once again the first eight verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. And this will be uh, this, this section that we've been going through forever now. It seems like this will be the last message in that, as, and then we'll move on uh, to other parts of the chapter next week. All right, but let's read one last time here this first eight verses of 2 Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Um, for if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither or neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think I've read that passage eight times and misread that eighth verse eight times uh, publicly. <laughs> um, it's just... It's slightly off as what you would think it would be. Um, so we've been looking at this, this list here of virtues. It says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. That virtue is talking about character, moral character. Um, you, you, can't have, you can't really live the Christian life without having moral character and, and having a desire and a willingness to do what's right. And then it says to virtue knowledge. To, to be a successful Christian, you have to know things. You have to grow in your knowledge, um, to learn about the Lord primarily, but also to learn about just life. And so we need to be growing in our knowledge. And then it says to knowledge temperance. Temperance is self-control. Um, we have to be in control of our self, control of our mind, control of our emotions, control of our bodies. Um, without self-control, we're headed for moral ship. And then it says to add to temperance, patience. Patience is endurance, this active endurance under the strains and the burdens of life. And then last week we looked at to patience, godliness. Add to patience, godliness. Godliness is another word for holiness. It's a word uh, for how that we live our life uh, according to that. So that brings us to verse number seven. And we're going to look at two of them tonight. Both these in verse number seven. It says into godliness, brotherly kindness, and a brotherly kindness, charity. So I'm going to handle these two together because I think they go together, and you'll see why here in a second. They're very similar. Um, and the way I'm going to approach this is we're going to talk about the definition of it first, uh, and then we'll talk about these virtues' importance, and then we'll talk about how to practice these virtues. And finally, I'm going to talk about a test of these virtues. So let's have a word of prayer, and we'll jump right into that. All right, Heavenly Father, help us as we think about brotherly kindness and, uh, and, uh, and charity tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to determine to grow in these areas of our life and to see the importance of these areas in our life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's start by talking about the definition of these two things. So interestingly, the Greek language that the Bible was translated from into English has four different words for love. Um, there was eros, which is a word for sensual or erotic love. That's where that word erotic comes from. There was uh, storge, which is a word for familial love, like the kind of love that a father has for his son uh, or vice versa. Um, but there were two other words for love. There's agape, which we're all very familiar with. That's the highest form of love. And then there was Philadelphia, which is brotherly love. And both of those words for love are in this verse. Okay, um, brotherly kindness is translated from Philadelphia and charity is translated from agape. Okay, so th these are two different kinds of love that are supposed to be manifest in Christians. Now, Philadelphia, that word brotherly love was only used in the ancient world of blood brothers. 
It was only a word that was used of blood brothers. It was something used in your family and your family only before the church started using it. In fact, it was when churches started to call each other brother and started to speak about having this brotherly love for each other, it was seen as scandalous by people. They didn't, they didn't think it was right that uh, people would talk about having that love, that special love that you're supposed to share with your brothers, with anybody else. And they didn't understand what we talked about this morning. We are knit together in love. We are, as believers, uh, closer in a sense than even blood relatives. Okay, so you have uh, brotherly love there. The other word, agape love or charity, is the most powerful love, word for love in the New Testament. And it's often used to describe God's love for us. Um, it is a self-giving love that expects no repayment. And so the truth is, you already know what these words mean. In fact, I am going to tell you exactly nothing new tonight. I'm sorry. It's just not, not that kind of a message. Um, you already know what these words mean. You know what brotherly kindness is. And you know what charity is. You understand these things. Um, you still need to be reminded of them. In fact, I'm not going to read the verse as part of my message tonight, but there's a verse where uh, the Apostle Paul, I think it was in Thessalonians, and he said, um, you don't need me to remind you about brotherly kindness, but grow in brotherly kindness, something to that effect. Like, even nature teaches you what this is supposed to be, but you still need to grow in this area. We're reminded over and over again about these things. So we've talked about the, uh, the, the definition. Let's talk about the importance of these. Why are these virtues, brotherly kindness and charity, why are they important? Well, the first thing I want you to understand is that they're important because they are the capstone of all of the other virtues. They're the last two things that we're supposed to add to our faith, right? We're supposed to be adding these things with diligence. You could say that brotherly kindness and charity are the capstones, they're the pinnacle, they're the end destination of all of these virtues. They're all building up to these last two, brotherly kindness and charity, okay? But they're also important because they are um, others-focused virtues. They're virtues that are, that, that, they're virtues that show up in our relationships. They're virtues that show up in how we deal with other people. Let me put it this way. It does not matter how much character you have. It does not matter how much you know about God. It doesn't matter what you can endure for God. It doesn't matter how holy or godly you are. None of those things matter if you're a jerk. Okay? None of those things matter if you don't treat people right. Let me say it how Paul said it. This is exactly how Paul said it. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I'm become as a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I, have, I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. In other words, if you get everything else right in the Christian life, I mean, you are super Christian. The things Paul decide, described there are definitely super Christian things, right? Like giving your body to be burned. That's super Christian stuff. Well beyond most of us. If you are super Christian and you don't have charity and brotherly kindness, it profits nothing to nobody. That's a really bad English sentence. It, it ain't no good, all right? I'm just, it's not good for anybody. Um, there's no profit. It's pointless. If you grow in every single one of these virtues that we talked about and you skip brotherly kindness and you skip charity, the whole exercise was pointless. I want you to think about a monk for a second. Think about a monk, some kind of a monk. I don't know anything about monks, okay, but imagine a monk. He takes it upon himself to be super Christian, super godly. And in his way, he goes up to a mountain somewhere, up to a monastery, and he locks himself in solitude in a room 
on top of a mountain all by himself. He speaks to no one. His food comes in every day through a slot in a door and goes out <laughs> through that same slot in the door. I'm sorry. Uh, just realize what I said there. Okay. And he spends his whole life in that room praying and studying the Bible and studying about God. Okay. I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't matter how spiritual that man is. It doesn't matter how much Bible he memorizes or how much time he spends praying. His life is a complete waste. It's a complete waste because he has no place to use the greatest of all Christian virtues, which is love. Think about this. Who was the greatest Christian who ever lived? Jesus. How did Jesus spend his time? Did he spend all his time in solitude? Or did he spend most of his time with people? We know he spent most of his time with people, right? Okay. Um, let, me, let me read you some other verses here. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Colossians 3, 14. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. 1 Timothy 1, 5. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Charity is the capstone virtue of the Christian life. And if you don't actually really love people, and we're not talking about people as an abstract, we're talking about the people right next to you. If you don't really love people, um, what's the point? What's the point? I mean, it's like making, imagine if I cook an incredible feast, right? Like I just, just spend days and weeks planning and, and baking, you know, rolls from scratch and cakes from scratch and cooking all different kinds of meats and gathering all kinds of ingredients and just making this epic feast and then cook it and never eat it. That'd be a waste, wouldn't it? Imagine building an incredible building. I read uh, today at lunch, we were sitting around the table and I was reading about this guy in Ohio in some town near Cincinnati uh, in, from the 1920s, who literally built himself a castle, like out of rocks. Like he was a genius. And he spent 40 years and like $10,000 or some ridiculously low amount of money building a massive castle in Ohio, outside of Cincinnati. Imagine spending all the time building this beautiful castle and never going inside, never living in it. That would be a waste. Imagine um, practicing an instrument, becoming a master, the best in the world at playing the piano or playing whatever the instrument is and never playing in front of other people. Okay? It's a waste. It doesn't matter if you have every single virtue on this list. If it doesn't break out into the way that you treat other people, it's a waste. It's a waste. Charity and brotherly kindness is where faith, character, knowledge, patience, and godliness get to come out and be seen, get to come out and be used. So we've talked about the definition of these virtues. We've talked about the importance of these virtues. Let's talk about the practice of these virtues. How do we put brotherly kindness and charity into action? How do we diligently add brotherly kindness and love to our life? Well, we, we've got, there's lots of places we could look for answers to that question. I was thinking about our church covenant today. Um, there's a couple parts of our church covenant that deal with this. Okay, uh, There's a phrase that says, We promise that we will engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love. And then there's a whole paragraph about that. Uh, we further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy of speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, 
and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure reconciliation without delay. It's a pretty good overview of putting brotherly kindness and charity into practice in a church. Um, I think one of the key words for us to understand how to practice brotherly kindness and charity is the word one another. The words one another. There are some form of one another, um, those words, they show up over 90 times in the New Testament. Okay? And if you pay, pay careful attention, they show us what it means to walk with brotherly kindness. Um, I'm going to talk about some attitudes and some actions that they show us uh, are to put in place in our life here. So let's talk about some attitudes. Okay? I'm going to read just a bunch of scripture. You can write down the references if you want to. Um, but let's talk about some of these. Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says, Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. So there's two different attitudes there. Kindly affectioned, it means to be warm-hearted towards people. Um, and then it says, in honor, preferring one another, that means to put other people ahead of yourself. Romans 15, 5 says, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Okay? So we're commanded to be like-minded. What does that mean? That means we have to work to get along with each other. That's, what that, that's all that means. Work to get along with each other. Don't let differences destroy relationships. Ephesians 4.32, Be kind one to another tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So there's two attitudes there, and an action, we'll come back to this verse later, but we're to be kind, we're to be tender-hearted, okay? Um, finally, 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. We're to be in an attitude of humility with each other, humble submission to each other. So if you're, if you're keeping count there, there's six different attitudes, kindly affectioned, um, others-minded, like-minded, kind, tender-hearted, and humble. Um, let me ask you this. Are you known as a warm-hearted, others-focused like-minded, kind, tender-hearted, and a humble person to other believers. When people think about you, is that what they think of? If they don't, then that means you need to grow in brotherly kindness. Grow in charity. That is our, that's supposed to be our command to other people. So let's talk about actions. Some one another actions. There's like 15 of these. I'm not going to go through all of them. I think I'll go through like five or six. Romans 14, 19, let us follow after things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify one another. We're supposed to be edifying each other. That means building each other up, building each other up, okay? Um, I, I pray that just you being here and being around other believers here builds you up in the Lord and that all of us are active in that work of building, edifying each other. Romans 15, 7 says, Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ received us to the glory of God. We're to receive each other. You know what that means? It means we're, to re we're to supposed to accept each other. We're supposed to accept each other. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. God did not accept me because I am great. <laughs> God did not accept me because I am perfect. He did not accept me because I'm a good person. He did not accept me because of... Uh, morality. He didn't accept me because of the way I dress. He didn't accept me because of any of that stuff. In fact, I could bring none of that to the table when I came to Jesus Christ. He accepted me on behalf of Jesus. And here it says we're supposed to accept each other, receive each other as Christ has received us to the glory of God. We are a church full of imperfect people, and those imperfect people are to be received as Christ receives us. Okay, Ephesians 4.2 says, With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. You know what forbear means? It means to put up with. It means to put up with. 
okay? Put up with each other. Do you know the Bible does not pretend that we aren't going to annoy each other? We pretend like we don't annoy, annoy each other sometimes, but the Bible does not pretend that we aren't going to annoy each other. The Bible doesn't pretend that there aren't going to be things in your life or your life or your life that bug me and vice versa. Okay, I'm sure there's a million things, me being the person that speaks, stands up here and speaks to you all the time. I'm sure there's plenty of things about my life that bug you. Okay, but we are to be forbearing each other, putting up with each other. Okay, if you're expecting absolute perfection out of every single person, you're not going to, you're not, you're going to be a very lonely person, right? That's not brotherly kindness. Ephesians 5.21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We're to submit to each other, submit to God-given authority. Romans 15.14, um, and I myself am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able to admonish each other. You know what admonish means? It means to warn. We have a duty to warn each other, right? If you see somebody going over a cliff, you know, as a believer, it's okay to gently say, hey, brother, that might not end up how you think it's going to end up. That, not, that might not be good for you, right? Maybe you need to turn around. Maybe you need to stop doing that thing. We we're to be able to be admonishing each other. One more, Ephesians 4.32. I read this earlier. Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, for God's sake, hath forgiven you. We're commanded to forgive, to forgive each other. Okay? That command is repeated over and over again because, as I said this morning, there will be plenty of opportunities to forgive people. In the Christian life. Now that's only about half the list. We could we could lead, look at lots of other actions that we're commanded to. Um, brotherly kindness and charity. I want to I want to talk about the test of these virtues, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. I've read parts of this already. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want to look at uh, at this passage here again. Look at verses four to seven with me. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things endureth all things. This is talking about charity, the capstone thing that we are supposed to be striving for as believers, the ultimate Christian virtue, charity. Jesus said that the church, his, the believers would be known for their love that they have for each other. I believe that's John 14. We'd be known for the love that we have for each other. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to think about something for a second, okay? Do you understand that worldly groups love each other? In a sense, they love each other. I'll give you an example. My dad is not a Christian. Um, I hope someday he becomes a Christian. It sure seems like the Lord's softening his heart little by little. But my dad, uh, my dad plays golf every day. Like he's just a golf fanatic. And he's got a lot of golf buddies. He's got a lot of friends. And last year, one of his golf buddies um, was trying to uh, help somebody on the side of the road and got hit by a car and died. Would you believe that all of him and his friends mourned uh, over the, in an over-the-top way? They mourned the loss of their friend that died. I mean, they really loved him. And it was obvious they really loved him. Believers, unbelievers love each other. Groups of unbelievers love each other. Like if you have a group uh, that gets together at the VFW or a group that gets together at the Lions Club for years and years and one of them passes away or one of them's in trouble, there's definitely love that's shown there. Okay? 
So what does it mean that Jesus said we as, as Christians would be known for the love that we have for each other? You understand none of those things that we've talked about require Christ. But we are called as believers to Christian love. We are called to charity. We're called to be known for it. We're called to be set apart from the others, from the world, set apart by our love. And here's the point I'm trying to make. Our love, the requirement of love that God has for us is supernatural love. Supernatural love. Our love, our charity, ought to be bigger than just a group of people that would like each other if they were in a bowling league together. You understand what I'm saying? Our charity ought to be bigger than people that would love each other if they just got together and played cards every week. There ought to be supernatural love. And supernatural love shows itself when these things happen here in verses 4 to 8. When we have to suffer long. When we have to uh, reject the natural desires of envy. When we have to reject our selfish desires. Okay? When we, when we have to go through things and bear things and believe things and endure things and forgive things. We as a church are called to be supernatural in those things. And that's where Christian love is supposed to stand above everything else. That's where Christian love stands apart as the pinnacle Christian virtue. Okay? Can you look at your life and look at evidence of times where you have forgiven people where a lost person would not forgive in that situation? Where you have uh, cared for people that a lost person would not care for. That is supposed to be evident all over our life. We're supposed to be people of brotherly kindness and charity. And um, the call for that is maybe the most difficult thing of all the things in this list that we're called to, the most difficult virtue. We need to add it diligently, work towards it diligently. All right, brotherly kindness and charity. Let's stand together. Brother Hedrick, if you want to come and, co and close us in a, in a song, I'd appreciate it. Yes. Heavenly Father, help us to be people marked by charity. Help us to be people that have true charity.